again. Oh, that's really nice to hear. Okay, continue. Right, there we go. So, um, my background is in music, and I suppose music underpins um, everything else I think about. Really, I'm I'm sort of paid to think about technology and education, um, but um, underpinning technology and education is communication, and um, Communication is a mystery as far as I can see and particularly musical communication is a mystery. Um, I want to start by, oh now I've got my thing in the wrong place haven't I, so let's just move that out of the way. I want to start by uh, drawing attention to um, the work of um, a systems theorist called Gregory Bateson. Now um, my path towards um, education and technology is through systems theory and when I studied music I became very interested in systems theory that's really where I started from and I think as I um, discovered more about music and more about technology I realized that that was what I really was I was a systems person. Now Bateson says that when we recognize anything when we when we make sense of the world we never make sense of a single thing. We're always moving between different descriptions, multiple descriptions of the same thing. And he's got this passage. Andrew and I were actually having a conversation. Uh, was it yesterday or the day before? We was, you asked, what is the difference? And uh, Bateson says, he gives a definition. He says, look, in order to have a difference, you've got to have two descriptions. You've got to have two versions of something in order to make a difference. I think this is a very, a very striking paragraph. This is from a book called Mind and Nature, which you can actually download online if you want. Um, the simplest, most profound is the fact that it takes at least two somethings to create a difference. To produce news of a difference, i.e. information, there must be two entities, real or imagined, such, such that the difference between them can be imminent in their mutual relationship and the whole affair must be such that news of their difference can be represented as a difference inside some information processing entity such as a brain. Now, I suppose that underpins everything I'm going to say today because I'm going to talk about this multiplicity, um, that the fact that even when we think we're seeing a single thing or even when we think we hear a single sound, it's never a single sound. And the most obvious way of demonstrating this is to use a, a frequency spectrum analyzer which I've got sitting behind the scenes somewhere here. Here we go. So I'm you know I, I want to try I want to try a little practical experiment. This will be a world first in Zoom that we actually sing a note and see the um, spectrum of the note as a series of parallel lines hopefully. So um, uh, maybe that's a bit loud. Okay. okay, after three. One, two, three. Love. Hang on, who's, who's singing the C still? <laughs> it's a G. Oh, the G. Sorry, I think it might be me. <laughs> Honestly, it's always one. Okay, after three, it's a G. One, two, three. Love. Okay, well, there you go. You've got a pattern. And, and you can play with this. So I've done, I've done this with people just to say, well, how many sounds are, are playing there? And providing everyone's singing in tune, of course, there's just one. But then you ask them, okay, so why have we got all these different lines in the spectrum? And um, what does that mean about the singleness of the sound? That, in fact, that it is made up of multiple frequencies which are all sort of working together. And you can do all sorts of exercises so you can sort of uh, encourage people to um, change the shape of their mouth while they sing. So that they go, they, where is it again? You can start with a big R sound, uh, not an R sound, but an R sound, um, and gradually become an O and then make it an R again. So you can do something like this. Oh, yeah. And you can see that I can manipulate the way that the descriptions of the sound change. And it's, it's kind of like the difference between hearing a piece of music on a very tinny transistor radio and hearing the full hi-fi thing. It's almost as if the richness of description 
is the, the factor which uh, determines the, the, the way that that uh, sound or that object makes sense to us. And I think um, even in education, as a teacher, I find myself, most of my activity as a teacher is in explaining the same thing or the same concept in many different ways. And uh, it's probably what I'm going to do with you today as well, is, is try to explain this central idea in a number of different ways. So that's, that's just a sort of little demonstration of this. Um, now I've got to get back to my slides. So the other thing I want to just highlight that when you have multiple descriptions of the same thing, in information theory, multiple descriptions of the same thing is called redundancy. It's effectively, you don't need those extra descriptions, but, but they, add, they add to the sort of process of communication in some way by adding redundancy. And that's got important sort of uh, resonances, which is another sort of uh, way of adding redundancy, incidentally, um, with, with uh, um, the way that we communicate. Now, um, in recent years, there's been quite a lot of work going on around the role of music and the role of sound in communication. And this has been particularly uh, associated with a man called Colwyn Trevathan, who's now in his 80s. He was at Edinburgh for a long time. And that he put together this uh, wonderful book I've got on the left-hand side called Communicative Musicality. And this was a bunch of psychologists and sociologists and musicians and composers who were all looking at the role of sound and music in ordinary communication. So they were looking at things like the music of words between mothers and babies, for example. They were looking at the musicality of animal communication. And this picture on the right hand side that I've got here, this is a fantastic paper on the musicality of dentistry. So this is the dentist and the patient and a, a sort of kind of notation of uh, the sounds which are exchanged. You can imagine the patients there with their mouth open and so on. Um, so I suppose I, this, this is the music that I'm most interested in really. This is the, this very broad look at music as a sort of sociological communicative phenomenon. And this isn't, although the communicative musicality thing is new, the actual study of music from this sociological perspective is not. And it was really pioneered by um, a sociologist called Alfred Schutz, who was, um, he, he was sort of the part of the first generation of phenomenologists who uh, came after Edmund Husserl. Schutz um, found himself in America um, in, well, it was during the war, but he would befriended uh, Edmund Husserl um, before he came and um, he started to pursue a way of thinking about communication, particularly um, drawing on Husserl's phenomenology. And um, he wrote a wonderful and extremely important paper called Making Music Together in 1951. This is from the journal Social Research, if you want to look up the, the uh, reference. This first paragraph of the paper is incredibly important, I think. Music is a meaningful context which is not bound to a conceptual scheme, yet this meaningful context can be communicated. So this is Schutz, who is a phenomenologist interested in communication. He was also a musician, incidentally. And he is asking, um, really fundamentally, how the hell does this work? Because music doesn't have reference. We don't have, um, you, it's not in the same way that you paint a picture and it's paint a picture of a dog. We don't have the musical equivalent of that kind of referential relationship between uh, an object in the world and uh, a sign which points to that object. Um, and yet, despite the fact that all our lang linguistic communication appears to work like that, um, and we appear to be able to communicate like that, music, we can still communicate, we communicate our feelings without reference. So the question is, what's going on? How do we understand this? And I think even when I think about educational communication, maybe even, even the communication that I'm doing now, um, there's so much more that happens which is beyond the words. And we see this even with the way pe people use technology. There's so much happens beyond the words, but how do we make sense of this? Now, Schutz has a word for this. He calls it polythetic. 
And polythetic is a word that he got from Edmund Husserl. And Husserl talks about polythetic as a way of thinking about the communication as process. So that communication occurs over time. And I think for musicians, obviously, polythetic and polyphonic um, not don't just sound similar. I think they're probably referring to very similar kinds of processes. Um, and, and Schutz would certainly have been aware of that. Um, so just coming back to my um, little example um, here, um, the temporal dimension is very important. So if you look at, uh, look at this sort of uh, graph of the frequencies of the sound, of course, it's, it's rolling, it's scrolling from left to right. And that's the time dimension. So this is, it, in, in sort of more uh, formal language, we could say this is the diachronic dimension of communication, the sound. But the structure of the frequencies going up on, on the sort of the y-axis here, that, that, that structural dimension is called synchronic. So it's this balance between synchronic and diachronic dimensions. And Schutz is interested in seeing how those two dimensions work with each other. Now, I just want to, I want to say something about the sociological history and context of this way of thinking. This is fundamentally a sociological view of communication. And I think it's probably fair to say in the music literature, the sociological view of communication has been pushed out by the psychological view. And I think this is a problem. Um, but you know, just to give you an idea and also where, where my thinking sort of comes in here. We start with Husserl and Husserl influences Schutz. They have a, a long correspondence and Schutz takes, Schutz becomes one of the main proponents of Husserl's work. Schutz, when he's in America, is befriended by um, Tolcott Parsons. And this is a hugely important moment because there is this sort of exchange of ideas between them and they have a correspondence which is written about um, by a man called Richard Grathoff. Uh, he wrote a book called The Theory of Social Action. And they, Parsons is kind of pushing Schutz to develop his theory in a more sort of, um, shall we say, a more sort of functionalist, slightly more mechanical way. And Schutz is gently pushing back, saying, I don't mean it to be quite like that. But, but Parsons Parsons, I think it's probably unfair to say Parsons is, is you know, necessarily distorting what Schutz is trying to say, but um, the American sociology is not the same after Parsons. He's hugely influential in the way that uh, the field develops. And Parsons creates, um, or I should say also Schutz has a, a massive impact in um, social constructionism as well, which is sort of uh, goes off in a slightly different direction. But Parsons introduces a very important idea called double contingency, which is very closely related to Schutz's idea. So Schutz is imagining, how do people communicate? Well, in order for me to talk to you, and it's quite hard actually at the moment, because I feel as if I'm talking to myself, but in order to, for me to talk to you, I have We're to here. have some kind, I know you're here. I have to have some kind of idea of who you are and how you are likely to respond to the utterances that I make. And, it's only with that sort of model of, first of all, what I want to say, but some understanding of how you're going to respond to what I'm able to say, that I'm able to choose the words that I can speak in the first place. So this is the double contingency. On the one hand, you've got this choice of what it is you want to say. And then in the second place, you've got a choice of what kind of model do I imagine of you listening to this and how you are likely to respond to actually make the communication work. And this, this is a very simple idea in many ways, but um, it's been hugely influential. Now, one of the people who was massively influenced by this is a German sociologist who, if we were German, everyone would know about, but because we're British, hardly anybody knows about. And he's a man called Nicholas Luhmann. And, um, Nicholas Luhmann uh, developed Schutz's idea into a full-blown theory of society and um, uh, social dynamics. And he was particularly influenced by um, uh, systems theorists. So this is the sort of the world that I'm interested in. So particularly he was influenced by 
a, a German uh, physicist called Heinz von Furster, who incidentally um, was a very close family friend of the Wittgensteins, and a, a mathematician called George Spencer Brown, uh, about whom we had a conference here. Andrew organized a conference about him last year. And um, Spencer Brown uh, had, had a very close connection to Bertrand Russell. So we have Russell and Wittgenstein influencing Luhmann here. And, um, and Luhmann has a, a, an oeuvre which is extraordinary uh, in, in its scope um, and intellectual power. And, you know, it's, it is a, a major piece of work. Luhmann, um, just to bring it more up to date, Luhmann uh, mentored and talked to um, um, a sociologist called Lot Leidersdorf, who I got to know about 10 years ago now. And uh, Leidersdorf has uh, used Luhmann's work, drawing on Schutz and Parsons and Husserl um, to study scientific communication and uh, communication practices in universities and industry. Um, and he's been influenced by uh, two people who um, are well known to other people in this room. So there's a, man called, a mathematician called Daniel Dubois and um, a mathematician called Lewis Kaufman, um, both of whom are good friends of Peter Rowlands. Um, so, so it's a kind of, you know, this is, this is how, this is how this sort of thinking about the sociology of communication uh, has evolved. I think it's always useful to have some sort of historical context because otherwise ideas just appear out of nowhere and it's difficult to know where they've come from. Now, I just want to dig into this idea of music's polythetic communication. So Schutz uses this word and there's a fascinating passage in his paper where he talks about the communication between dead composers and living performers. And he's, he's thinking, well, how does this work? And he says, okay, well, separated by hundreds of years, the latter participates. So this is the performer. The, the performer participates with quasi simultane simultaneity in the former stream of consciousness by performing with him step by step the ongoing articulation of his musical thought. The beholder thus is united with the composer by a time dimension common to both, which is nothing other than a derived form of the vivid present shared by the partners in a genuine face-to-face -face relation such as prevails between a speaker and listener. So he's basically saying, when I play Beethoven, I'm having a conversation with Beethoven. Now, I think many performers will say the same thing. And the question is, okay, so what's going on? Time clearly plays a really important part in this process. And interestingly, the word polythetic, if you Google it now, you won't come up with, you might come up with Schutz because he is famous for using this word. You, you have to dig to find out where it originally came from, but it's used by data scientists. And the data scientists use it to describe clusters of data of things which are not united by common variables. So the, the, thing, the picture on the right is a list of favorite things. Now, my cluster of favorite things is going to be an array of all sorts of stuff which don't have any unifying characteristics except that there's something which you can't quite put your finger on to say actually no they are they all belong in this category of favorite things and i think the data scientist's definition of polythetic and schutz's definition are essentially the same and um, i made a video a little while ago just to explain how i, I thought that they, th those two things are related So where does this come in music? Well, we are effectively talking about a sociology of um, musical communication. And more importantly, um, this seems to be a kind of a sociology of anticipation because it's anticipation which is the thing which seems to be the coordinating force whereby um, the performer and the composer can communicate or different performers playing together. They're sort of looking at each other in that sort of double contingency relationship. They're looking at each other and sort of um, thinking, okay, what are you going to do next? I'm going to do this. And, and then we can come together and we can gradually work together and, and produce a sort of coherent thing together. Now, um, I don't, you probably know this book. It's quite famous. Um, David Huron's book, uh, Sweet Anticipation, which is probably from about 10 years ago now. Um, and uh, music and the psychology of expectation. And I mean, Huron does take a 
um, psychological view. So it, it's something that happens in brains. And I've, I've got something to say about that. He's got a nice example because he also uses the tools of information theory as a way of exploring expectation. And I'm going to say something about um, information theory. So this, these are the systems people who start to infiltrate uh, the thinking about expectation and, and sociology um, after Parsons. Um, so, and he's got this little example. So he says, okay, so we've and you ask them to try and sing along to the melody or anticipate the melody, and you compare their accuracy with the accuracy of a bunch of American musicians um, who are trying to do the same thing. And I don't know if you can hear the piano, but I'll just play this. And, you, and it's kind of interesting because you kind of, you listen to the tune, you think, oh God, what, what's it doing? How does that work? I don't know if anybody uh, fancies having a go at singing it <laughs> without looking at the music. <laughs> the, the, the bit that I'm familiar with is, is the, the A flat, um, is the pellet. Yes. So that, yeah. So I'm yeah. kind of familiar with that, but yeah, it's a, it's a, that's, a, that's a cultural thing, of course. Yeah. yeah. It is, and it's very interesting. So I, I think this is a, an interesting experiment. Now you can compare that to, um, oh, can you? Wait a minute. I should be doing something there. Oh, there we go. You can compare that to this sort of double contingency um, situation. Maybe you've got an American musician and you've got a Balinese musician, and one is trying to teach the song to the other. Now, so they're looking at each other. They're looking at each other's facial expressions. They're, they're sort of listening to what's happening. And you can imagine that the, uh, the European or American musician is thinking, oh, what the fuck are you doing now? Okay, right, I'll do that. Just do that bit again. And that is, Schutz calls this, this is this tuning in to the inner world of the other. And he's saying this is the essence of, um, this is the essence of musical communication where somehow we're able to tune in to the inner world of the other through the flow of time. And um, what's particularly interests me about what Huron's done here is, um, is that he's used uh, information theory, he's used entropy, uh, which is a measurement in information theory, it's a mathematical thing, as a way of trying to um, understand what's going on. And, and actually Kenneth has been doing some similar experiments recently as well, which is, uh, is how we got to know each other. Um, now, okay, so what am I talking about? Entropy, what the hell is that? So this comes from the work of a guy called Claude Shannon. And Shannon was an electrical engineer and he had a very practical problem because he needed to understand how to send messages down phone lines over large distances and work out, you know, how much, um, how much bandwidth was required to uh, transmit a message um, as, as, as effectively as possible. And he wrote an equation which was actually based on an equation from physics, um, which was created originally by Ludwig Boltzmann. And um, Boltzmann's equation is about um, the dissipation of heat in, um, in a material, in, in you know, metal or whatever it might be. Um, and Shannon was interested in um, the way, he saw a sort of similar dynamic in the degradation of signals. Um, and so he thought, well, he could probably use the same equation. Now, there's quite a lot of discussion about, um, he, he may have actually got Boltzmann completely wrong, but this equation has been incredibly important. We would not have the internet were it, for the, were it not for this equation. All our um, compression algorithms, which are fast at work behind the scenes in Zoom, all depend on this equation. And I just wanted to give you a quick demonstration of what entropy is all about, because I did some work with um, Lot Leidersdorf at Christmas, and we, I wrote a little program. And so you can imagine that my two text boxes here are two people talking to each other. And as I, as I type a message, it looks at every character in the message and what the equation means is basically you take every element of a message, so every letter in my case, and you, um, you add up the probability of each element 
and multiply it by the log of the probability of each element and you get a number. And it turns out that the more surprise there is in a message, so the more, um, the more I type random characters like this, the higher my entropy value is. And you can see my program, it just lists all the different, um, all the different uh, variables. It works out the probability of them, then it works out the log, and then it multiplies the two, and then it adds all of this up, and it produces 4.6872, okay? Um, and if you've got a lot of redundancy, now redundancy effectively is just kind of saying the same thing. So if you've got a lot of redundancy, so I just have AAAAA, the, the entropy is actually nothing because um, the probability is one here, the log of the probability, well, the log of one is zero. And so the entropy is zero. If I have one element there, um, then my entropy goes up. And you think, well, this has got a musical analog. So you can imagine I can have a repeated accompaniment. Doing so so something really stupid. So, you know, there's a long, long period where nothing happens. And then suddenly something different happens. And you could, or you, you, anything. Um, that is surprising. So entropy is a kind of index of surprisingness. And the more surprising it is, the more kind of crazy it is, the higher the value. Now, you can also have, uh, this, this program was originally written to explore the idea that two people could talk to each other. So I can have entropy in one person and entropy in another. And um, Shannon has a measure of what he calls mutual information which is a relationship between, of the common ground between one person who's talking and the other person who's talking. Or the, you know, one message and one message produced by one source and a message produced by another source. And we can get a measure of mutual information. And you can almost think of that as a measurement of harmonization in, in dialogue or um, social relations. So, um, although this is kind of very, in a way, it's very sort of mathematical, a little bit crude. It's also extremely interesting and very practical because everybody knows, everybody who works with anything to do with data knows something about information theory and uses the entropy calculations. And there is a history of people using this in music. Oh, there's my, uh, Shannon's diagram also maps on to the double contingency diagram as well. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of, um, all of these things sort of resonate with one another, I think. However, um, there are problems. So there, there are lots of people in, in music analysis. Uh, I'm going to talk about Leonard Meyer in a minute uh, because he did loads of stuff with this in the 60s and 70s. This, this graph, you probably recognize, you, you know where this comes from. This is um, Lerdahl and Jackendorf. Um, they're, they're sort of uh, grammatical breaking down of music into components. Uh, they're also coming from a similar place. They don't use entropy in the same way, but they're, they're sort of coming from the same kind of uh, space. Um, but there are problems with doing this kind of analysis. You kind of have to say, well, okay, you're counting this stuff, but you're counting it. Who's the observer? You know, how can you make any objective? It, it almost scientizes um, musical communication. Um, but actually, there's no critique as to who chooses what is counted and who, you know, how do you decide? But I think that's probably a, a more broad problem in um, music analysis generally. They use very sort of um, rigid uh, formal mathematical models to think about how music works. So one of the common ones, which is used by people like Meyer, is a Markov chain model, which I'll, um, I, I can demonstrate actually. And this is a very computery uh, sort of metaphor for trying to think about how surprising things might develop. In, an, in a sort of algorithmic way. A lot of people who are doing algorithmic music, um, you know, computer generated music, they, they use things like uh, these, these kind of techniques, Markov chain models. And, and it's, it's, it's a little bit crude. Uh, there's a lovely website here. Uh, introduction to Markov chain simplified. It's got these little dynamic, um, oh, I hope they can't go away. He's got these little dynamic, um, models oh no it's not here 
I will, I'll find it. Um, there, there are some models that you can play with and you can see how the Markov chain actually, uh, actually works and develops. Um, but, but it sort of leaves you thinking, but this, yes, it's fascinating, but it's not very musical. And um, so it's not, it's, it's, it sort of misses the point. And actually just before this session, Andrew and I were talking about some developments in machine learning and how machine learning is being used to generate music. But again, it's the same problem. It's not very musical. So there's a gap between the way we think about um, mathematics and, and artificial intelligence and all of these things and the way we think about really profound natural phenomena like music. There are other assumptions that people make when they do this kind of analysis. They, they make assumptions about how do you segment events in time. And obviously that's a more general problem in music analysis, but it's, it doesn't go away here. I think this is the key point. And I think a lot of these information theory approaches assume that music is, now this is a technical term, a godic. What that means is that the beginning of the piece you know every single variable of what's about to happen throughout the whole piece. Now, as many uh, people who've studied dynamic systems will tell you, that's not true of any living process. No living process shows us that we can, ex uh, we can sure. completely describe all the possible states in the future from the beginning. We can only do it retrospectively. And even then it's a kind of, it's a kind of choice. Um, so this, this business of ergodicity or the non-ergodicity of music is incredibly important, I think. And I think the other key criticism you can make about the problem of using entropy in music is that musical organization, it, it kind of suggests that musical form, an artistic form is in some way arbitrary, is some way the result of a stochastic process. But, um, I suppose you, you can and perhaps should ask, well, is it? It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it's arbitrary, except that, of course, people like Beethoven or whoever it might be can do crazy things, but they're never arbitrary. So, so you know, having sort of just covered the problems with this, I want to talk about where I've gone with it and, and been doing some uh, stuff around this. And I, what I want to say is that the key to perhaps getting to a new um, understanding of music and the use of uh, a, a new understanding of musical communication is to consider anticipation as a kind of third dimension in communication. And it's almost as if when you go into three dimensions, um, you, you kind of want to generate a, a vanishing point. Um, because that's what, you know, in art, that's what we have. We have a vanishing point. And so it's a question of um, how the process of, processes of reflexivity enter into the emerging processes of making sound and the, um, the structural qualities of that sound, how that then actually gives us this sort of rich picture of where things are likely to go. How is it that we know that um, you know, our final sort of dominant seven is going to go to the tonic? Now, loads of people have written about that. How is it that we really don't know where, where that's going to go? Um, but this, th these things remain mysteries, and I think perhaps there is some, there, there's some light that can be uh, shed on those mysteries through a more sociological approach which embraces anticipation. Now, an anticipatory system is, is formally defined. Um, there was work in biology by a man called Robert Rosen. Actually, this is his diagram at the top here, which I've got my thing in the way of. Um, he, he, he talks about an anticipatory system must contain a model of itself. And you and I are anticipatory systems. If we weren't, we wouldn't be able to survive in the world and we wouldn't be able to communicate because unless we've got a model of ourselves and a model of the people we're talking to, it wouldn't work. So, um, so this, this is this is kind of kind of a key feature in in living systems. There is a, 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 a another statement of this, uh, which is a very famous one by Roger Conant and Ross Ash, Ross Ashby. Now, Ross Ashby was a, um, one of the founding figures in cybernetics, and they say every good regulator of a system is a model of that system. 
I often think about this statement in relation to the university and ask whether the university has a good model of itself. What's the answer? Let's, let's not go there. Um, and I think um, more controversially, uh, there's an amazing paper by um, uh, Nicholas Luhmann at the end of his life where he suggests that to have a model of oneself is to invent a past and a future. Effectively, it means you, you're inventing time. Um, and uh, th that's, that's, there's something very, very important in what he's saying there, I think. So really what we have to do is to account for the way that reflexivity interacts with events in time. And this is a diagrammatic way of thinking about this. So um, just drawing on my, um, uh, my frequency analysis that I showed, you've got the synchronic dimension going down, um, down the side here. We've got, this is time's arrow, where events occur, you know, events occur over time. And, and in a sense, you can say, well, this is in the direction of um, the increasing entropy in the universe. The in universe is sort of getting more disordered over time. But then there's a reflexive process which is happening within us, which is trying to make sense of all of this. And the reflexive process is actually increasing order. And so you've got this sort of dynamic, and, and as these two processes are moving in opposite directions to one another, they're influencing and being influenced by the synchronic and structural dimensions operating um, along this, uh, along this uh, y, y axis here. Now, I think um, fundamentally, this is what I think is happening in um, musical communication. It'd be very interesting to know what you think about this, but um, I think this, is, this is, seems to make sense to me. And my big challenge has really been to how to, make, how, to make, how to operationalize this, how to make it into something tangible that we can actually point at and say, oh yes, this is, this is an interesting thing here. Um, but I think this is, the over, this is the general dynamic of it. What I've been doing is I've been generating fractal type images by analyzing musical events. And in fact, I've been doing it by analyzing all sorts of things, even learning interactions. Um, and I'm interested in these fractal images because I think fractals are absolutely key in understanding how we anticipate things. Um, just to give you, um, actually, I won't talk about Maya just now, I'm gonna move on. I'll come on to that in a minute. Right, okay, so this, this is the work that I've been doing. So I've been looking at, um, scores um, and you can analyze scores with a, a computer library called music 21 and the music 21 will look at a, a music file and say and give you all the note values and it will give you be able to analyze the harmonies and it will look at the rhythms and do all sorts of things like that and you can take all that data and you can analyze it for entropies and that's basically what my graph at the bottom here is doing and then you can take that graph and you can generate a kind of fractal picture from the graph. Um, and the way I've generated the fractal picture is basically I've got two, um, two adjacent cells. One is set to uh, one if um, the line in the graph goes up and the other is set to zero. Or if the line goes down, it reverses. So it's either, uh, a, well, it's a zero and a one in that case, or it's a, um, a one and a zero in this case. So that's how I get this sort of checkered, checkered pattern. Um, I'll come back to that in a second because I want to say something a bit more about the fractals and why they're so important. As you probably know, uh, fractals are self-similar patterns. And if we're going to anticipate anything, then it's very important that um, we're somehow related, we're somehow able to relate the pattern of what's, what we think is about to happen to a pattern of something that's happened in the past. Now, this, um, this is a, obviously a, a, a very kind of, um, this is not a fractal in the same way that mine, uh, the one I've just shown you generated from the data. This is a proper mathematical, uh, um, it's called a Sapinski triangle. But you can see that I've got um, a small pattern here. And let's say that happens at the beginning of the piece of music with a certain set of variables. So I've got my emergent variables moving across the top. So something happens at the beginning here, but then at a larger structural scale with maybe with different variables, maybe it's now, we're now looking at the 
um, harmonic progressions or, or whatever it might be at a different level, but those harmonic progressions generate a similar pattern to the pattern that might have been generated in the, the original moment by say some sort of motivic, um, motivic uh, idea. And then maybe you move further on in the piece and you actually see some sort of tonal um, uh, relationship, some sort of sequence of keys, which has the same pattern as um, the, 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 the uh, harmonic relationship earlier on, which then relates back to um, the, the motivic cell at the beginning. So fractals in this sense, the, the way th the suggestion is that the way that we can anticipate what's happening is because there's some commonality of deep patterning which relates patterns which have occurred with different variables at an earlier stage. And there's this kind of continual uh, recapitulation of a fundamental pattern throughout a piece. And, and I think this idea in a sense is not new. It's just that um, what the techniques that I've been looking at um, recently have been highlighting is, is, is a way of trying to, or a different way of trying to operationalize this with information theory, but also um, pointing out that actually the key thing in the formation of a pattern is the fact that it's got holes in it. And of course we've got holes in the pattern here and it's the holes that make the pattern. So you kind of have to say, okay, so how do all the different variables that make up a piece of music contribute to the holes that comprise the pattern? And so, you know, this is just summary. How can we anticipate what's about to happen based on what's happened in the past? And the fractal over time shows how future patterns can be predicted. So this is my, um, this is the, the, a, a piece, this is actually a piece of Bach. Um, this is the uh, Symphonia number nine, which is, uh, where is it? It's this one. It goes on like that. Um, it's a fugue, or it's, it's sort of fugal in its, its writing. So there are sort of commonalities and lots of, uh, 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 relationships between the different voices and actually I produced my graph as a, a set of relations between the different voices and then plotted it as a fractal and I, I think that the graph is probably the data isn't so um, clear at the moment but I was sort of just suggesting well actually you can look at a picture like this and actually say well there are sort of key moments where a certain pattern keeps recurring now does that have a relationship to our own sense of expectation as to what's going to happen at a different structural level as a piece develops. And, and I suppose that's a sort of practical question which I'm asking myself at the moment. Um, but um, producing these graphs has been very interesting. Now, I just wanna go back to um, Maya because um, you probably know yeah, you, um, I don't know if people know uh, Maya's book, Explaining Music. Um, it's a, it's a, something of a classic, um, and Maya's work is probably uh, one of the key uh, moments in trying to use information theory to understand music. Anyway, at the end of um, explaining music, um, Maya does some easy stuff at the beginning. He's sort of he's got this idea that music is a pattern. So the, you know we kind of share this concern really. That music is a pattern, and the piece is somehow a way of completing the pattern. But um, he thinks that it's kind of simple and uh, it's all about um, uh, lines uh, in the melody and in the harmony, setting up expectations which then have to be fulfilled by the rest of the piece. And he produces these graphs to show how different, um, different ideas in the piece um, develop over time. Now, to be honest, he's kind of set himself up he's almost set himself up to fail with, particularly with the Beethoven piece, and he kind of acknowledges it, which is interesting, um, because um, Beethoven obviously just never plays by the rules. And so, you know, although he tries to argue that the beginning of this sonata, which is, uh, you
saying it properly, but um, he's trying to argue that uh, somehow you can go from that and you can sort of, that sets up the expectation for what Beethoven does next, which is. I, I struggle to understand where the connection is, frankly. It's kind of, it's such a ride to listen to this because you kind of think, where the hell is he going? Um, and I think Maya is almost sort of saying, well, we can look at it like this, but actually it introduces a lot of issues. And what I want to say against his position is that there is a pattern, there is a process going on, but the ending of the piece is not the completion of the pattern. The ending of the piece results from the co-construction of a selection mechanism, which selects silence or nothing, as the next moment. Somehow we get to the end of the piece and we know it's over. And the question is how? How do we know it's over? And it's very interesting. I did, uh, Maya uses, he sort of covers himself a bit. He says, look, um, this doesn't really work. At the end, uh, uh, in explaining music, he says, you know, this, this is hard. And he uses a funny word, which I had to look up. He says, he says, I am not an expert in the aesthetics of music. And I had to look this up and not even the dictionaries had this in. I found a, another book about Maya talking about what he meant by aesthetic relationships. And it's, uh, he says it constitutes the kinesthetic sensing of the ethos and character of a musical event. And uh, I thought, well, that's very interesting because I think that's exactly what Schutz is talking about. It's the ethos and character of a musical event in that communicative situation of making music. And, um, and really what Maya does is he takes a, a incredibly complex and messy um, phenomenon like the, the Beethoven Sonata, and you can see I've got my squiggly drawing here at the bottom, and he kind of he tries to draw a straight line through it and, and say, no, it's about this. But in doing that, he kind of ignores all the mess. And, and I think, well, it's not quite that simple, is it? The other thing that he does is he takes time out of the equation. Although all his diagrams are kind of process diagrams, the actual temporal flow of time and the way that categories emerge, that sort of gets, it gets washed over. And, and you know, this is the difference between, I don't think he knew Schutz's work, but Schutz argues that the time is central to the process of musical understanding. And so, you know, it's making time an essential and an inseparable um, aspect of the, the other dimensions. So, you know, you can look at a piece like um, Les Adieux and say, uh, okay, so we get to the end. How did we get there? And, and this is the process. It's a kind of, you know, we, somehow we've all arrived at the end, but we've arrived at it with all these different ideas and variables knocking into each other. And by some magical process over time, they produce this sense that everyone feels that we're at the end. And you've got these many, so this is, this is the polythetic uh, communication really. This is, this, is, this is what it's about. And so, you know, you can look at the Beethoven and you can say, okay, so how, how does it end? Well, like all pieces, it ends, I'm just gonna start in the middle of them. So obviously, The only thing to say about that is how much redundancy is there, how much repetition, loads of it. And we, of course, we see this in uh, at the ends, endings of a lot of pieces. But there's particular quality to that repetition and that redundancy, which would make you think, well, if that's how you're finishing, you, you've got to generate this amount of redundancy. What happened in the beginning to necessitate you to actually create that amount of redundancy to give people a sense that you'd really reached the end. And so that is where the sort of dynamics and the pattern is in, in this piece, I think. Sorry, I'm waffling on. So this, this is the beginning, which I've just played to you, so we don't really need to do that now. Um, but
But what we see here is lots of variables, lots of ideas. They're all knocking into each other. And, and it creates this sort of kind of chaotic uh, pattern, which is a bit like the sort of wild patterns that you see dancing around in the, in the, in the graph that I've got at the bottom here, this entropy graph here. Um, so, um, yeah, so anyway, so, and this is, this is uh, what I was doing with the bark. So um, basically my graph is looking at the entropies of rhythm, harmony, voice pitches, pitch density, dynamics, take all of those, look at how they interact with one another, and they're generating this pattern of um, well, repeated patterns, which um, people are then kind of uh, trying to sort of feed their way through and trying to use that as a guide as to what might happen next. Now, when people are playing music together, and these, I've, you've seen this, when people are playing music together, it's quite interesting to go back to Okay, so what happens in that social situation? So everybody who's playing a piece of music um, is, first of all, immersed in a flow of events. They're building a possible anticipatory model based on those events, and then they're trying to select which model actually fits the situation that they're in. So which model of you do I need to build to actually communicate with you? And um, I produced uh, this diagram to sort of summarize that dynamic. So in a sense, at the bottom, we've got the shared performance environment where people are obviously making sounds and, and looking at each other. There's lots of sort of physical uh, communication going on. Then you're trying to sort of construct different models of what the future might be like. Each person is doing this. And you're producing many kinds of models. And your job, in a sense, is to make a selection. Which model do I go with? Which model do I choose? Is it the yellow one, the black one, the blue, and so on? And the other person is doing the same. Now, by the time you reach the, you know, the, the sort of real tuning in to understanding, oh, this is what the composer was doing, or this is what you're doing as a performer, or that's how the song goes, you've reached some sort of consensus that this is the model that we're both working towards, and we understand something of what Schutz calls the inner world of the other. So um, I, think, I think that probably sums up what I want to say at this point. I was going to say a little bit more, oh, well, I can do a lot more with these, um, these fractal techniques. So I've been looking at, um, I've been looking at uh, audio files, and you can analyze audio files and the frequency spectrum in audio files in the same way. Um, and I'm also looking at uh, learning conversations in that way as a way of doing that. But I think I probably talked for enough. I probably.